say that tonight is actually the culmination of about four and a half years worth of conversations, letters, faxes, uh, and the timing has finally been propitious to make our very special guest. Why we were so interested in Jim is that his work came at, I think, a very uh, important time in the recent history of American narrative filmmaking. Uh, I, I would be uh, one among many who would credit his films with reinvigorating American narrative films, with having really the same impact on filmmaking in this country that John Cassavetes had in the late 1950s and early 60s, uh, in coming up with a new cinema that was grounded in the urban experience in concrete details of a lived reality that was much closer to our lives than the films that came out of the commercial studio system. You'll hear more about Jim Jarmusch from our visiting critic who was here last about three years ago in connection with the retrospective of William Klein's work. If you have our monograph on Jim Jarmusch, you'll have read his writing. It's Jonathan Rosenbaum, who has been our partner in a number of projects here, but most especially our advisor in preparing both the retrospective and dialogue for this evening and the parallel program that plays out on Tuesday evenings. The Guilty Pleasures and Innocent Influences program that gives you a little bit of a sense of the context of work that uh, led to, I think, a, a really unique sensibility in contemporary filmmaking. So, Jonathan Rosenbaum from the Chicago Reader, an author of, of a co-author of Midnight Movies with uh, Jim Hoberman, uh, a, a forthcoming volume called Placing Movies to come out with his earlier autobiograph, Old Moving Places. Then finally, an extraordinary volume that he put together with Peter Bogdanovich last year uh, on the writings of and, and critical commentary by the late Orson Welles. So it's been about four years to say this, but it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome here to the Walker Art Center for a Regis Dialogue, Jim Jarmish and Jonathan Rosenbaum. See you all. Um, no slam dancing or body surfing during the show. <laughs> I wanted, I thought maybe one way of beginning, let's say, is asking Jim, how did you first get interested in movies? When did it start? In making them or just enjoying them? Enjoying them first. Um, the first movie that I remember really having an impact on me was uh, the Robert Mitchum film, Thunder Road, that I saw on vacation in a drive-in theater with my mom and my sister in Florida, and I was about six, I think. And previous to that, I'd only seen um, Walt Disney movies like Son of Flubber and those kinds of things. <laughs> and to see a movie with, with all that violence and action that's when I really started being interested in, in the screen being alive like that. Now, how, how old were you then? I don't remember exactly, maybe six or seven, I think. After that, did you see lots of movies? or? Well, I didn't have much. I grew up in Akron, Ohio, and there wasn't a big uh, selection, although there was a, a theater called the State Theater um, that had Saturday matinees that they would show like the Fly or Attack of the Giant Crab Monsters. So they would show a double bill every Saturday, and my mother used to drop me off there so that she could really, I guess, get rid of me for the afternoon. So I used to go there a lot. I loved going to see those films. So other than that, in Akron, there re really wasn't much until I was a teenager, and there was a, what was back then they called an art house, which meant they showed like European sex films. In the uh, on the weekdays and on Friday nights, they had this program called uh, Underground Cinema, and we used to go there all the time. And we had fake ID cards saying that we were old enough. And um, there we saw like a lot of different things, including Chelsea Girls by Andy Warhol and uh, some Stan Brakhage films mixed in with um, you know Reefer Madness. And so this the, was like in the 60s. 
This was yeah. in the late 60s, early 70s, yeah, late 60s. Well, at what, at what point in all of this did you decide you wanted to make films? Well, I didn't decide at all until um, I went to college and to study literature. I really wanted to be a writer. And uh, my last year, I guess, at, at uh, Columbia, I, w I studied in Paris. And um, it was there that rather than attending the classes I was supposed to be attending, I ended up spending most of my time at the Cinematheque or in movie theaters. And when I returned to New York, I had no clue like, what to do with myself. So I, I was really interested in, in movies by that point. And my writing was starting to um, take on elements of screenplays as little Sort of like, I don't know if you know the Burroughs book, The Last Words of Dutch Schultz. Oh, sure. Yeah. That's written in a way like a screenplay, kind of fake screenplay. And some element, elements like that were entering into my own writing. And um, then I applied to go to NYU Graduate Film School. But I, I, it was just, I don't know why I even tried, because I, I had no money and I had never made a film. And for some reason, they accepted me. I guess that's why. <laughs> So um, then I got uh, financial assistance and went and started studying film there. That's interesting. So actually, was the uh, the trip abroad at Columbia your first trip uh, out of America? or? Um, yes, it was the first time I'd ever been. I, I don't even think I'd been in Canada, which is way out of America. <laughs> If you're from Akron, you know, Toronto. So. No, well, I'm, I'm mentioning it just because it seems to me one thing that's, to me, a most unique among for uh, your films is that they're the films of someone who actually, of an American who actually seems to feel at home outside of America in some ways, and which is very unusual. So it was something I've never gotten around to asking when you first been to Europe, but that was... Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's that I feel... How did you put that? Well, at home. Well, at home. I guess what I, I mean I is... I feel not at home in America, but yeah. not necessarily at home outside of America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that seems a better distinction, actually, yeah. Um, so, I take it it was while you were at NYU that you actually made permanent vacation. Was that, or was that after? Yeah, well, that's... Um, I began making Permanent Vacation as my thesis film at NYU Graduate Film School, but I had been given a, um, I had gotten a, ironically enough, a, a fellowship called the um, Louis B. Mayer Foundation Fellowship. Uh, the, you know, so I, they mistakenly sent the money to me rather than directly to the school to pay my tuition. So, I used that money to make the film rather than pay tuition, so I did make the film, although I didn't at that time get a degree from the school. They weren't, they weren't pleased with my lack, my, the fact that I didn't pay tuition. They also weren't pleased with the film I made. So. Oh. And was that, the, was that the very first film you made, or did you ma had you made any shorts? No, I had one? made uh, two or three short films before that as a student which I think are lost, hopefully lost forever. <laughs> um, and was in terms of, so it was basically the Mayor Grant that paid for the film altogether, or what did you, you had to go to for other sources uh, too? Yeah, I got some phony like car loan too at the time from a bank, so, <laughs> so I was able to make the film. The budget was about $12,000. Now, one thing that I've, it seems like it's true of a lot of your films, but I'm, I'm, never, I'm not sure whether it's, ever, it's true of Permanent Vacation too. I have the impression that you actually do casting before you write your scripts often. That in other words, that you, when you write your scripts, it's with very particular actors in mind. And I'm wondering if that was, if that was true at all of Permanent Vacation also. Yeah, it was. I mean, I still consider myself, and I don't, I don't consider this to be derogatory, really, even, but I think of myself as kind of a fake film director because I started making films with my friends, basically, and writing things with them in mind and have kind of continued that procedure, although the ava my availability to actors or to people with um, more experience 
has widened. So I, you know, that's changed. And I, because I've made films and traveled and met people because of the fact that I've made films, I've met people who also work in films and actors. And so now that, that scope is widened, but it's still pretty much the same premise. I write with an actor in my head for a particular character, and if I'm not able to, to um, hoodwink that person into being in a film or whatever, then I, I rewrite it thinking of someone else. But I still work that way. Well, I know that uh, like John Lurie is, is in uh, Permanent Vacation. Um, and I think he, well, the, let's say the only one in, let's say, a very large role, I think, who probably has stayed with you on other films. But uh, was, 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 uh, were many of the other actors also at NYU, or any of them? Or, or were they, no, no. none of them. In fact, none of the people in Stranger Than Paradise, except for Esther Ballant, were actors at the time. Um, John and Rich, Richie Edson were musicians and had not acted. Although John had made several Super 8 films of his own in a kind of Jack Smith style. I don't know if you've seen them. Um, one's called Men in Orbit, and uh, I forget what the other one is. But Well, what about uh, Chris Parker? Chris Parker was a kid that I met on the street, a friend of mine. He was 14 when I met him, and he used to, uh, we used to go to CBGB's almost every night back then, the late 70s. And Chris Parker was a real kind of con fast-talking con man. And he had a way to, he knew Hilly Crystal, who owns CBGB still, who used to let, somehow he'd get in, and then he'd go to the back door where they load equipment in and open it for me to get in, because we didn't have money to, to pay to go in, not every night. So he was like, I used to hang around with him, and he used to sneak me into CBGB's, and he was a friend of mine, very interested in all kinds of music, particularly bebop and, and punk rock, which seems like a kind of odd combination, but somehow makes more sense now, I guess. Well, maybe that's a pretty good, that sounds like a pretty good lead into uh, actually the first clip we're going to be looking at, which is from Permanent Vacation and features Chris Parker along with uh, an actor named Frankie Faison, is it? Or? Faison. Faison. So maybe we could look at that now? So. Well, I'd be very curious to know like, where exactly that story came from. <laughs> um, <laughs> or, th that's a joke that I forget the comedian who originated it. I heard it on the radio late at night once and just lifted it. You know, I, I don't remember whose joke it is. But I think you can see why they didn't want to give me a degree. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the same time, though, the, the poster that you see behind them is for The Savage Innocence, which is a film of Nicholas Ray, and Nicholas Ray was one of your teachers at NYU. Yes. Um, was, what, did he have any play any role at all on uh, advising you on this film? Well, uh, that was the main reason I went back to NYU. It's a three-year program. And my third year, when I had run out of money, I, I went to the director of the school, Laszlo Benedek, who directed The Wild One. And, uh, and he said, listen, um, Nick Ray is going to teach here this year, and he needs uh, uh, an assistant. And I think you would be good. And I said, yeah, but I, I came in to tell you I'm not coming back to school. I don't have any money. So he said, listen, come tomorrow and meet Nick, and um, I'll see if I can help you get this fellowship to come back to school, the Louis B. Mayer Fellowship. <laughs> so um, I came and I met Nick Ray, who was like a big hero to me at that point before I ever met him. And uh, he asked me that day if I would, would be his assistant in the school year. So I, that's why I returned to school, basically. And um, I was writing this screenplay toward the end of Nick's life, actually, and was um, showing him the script. And he, uh, well, that's kind of a boring story about the script. Well, I know, but, uh, but he, did, he did advise you on it, though, to some extent. Yeah, he kept telling me. <laughs> All right, OK. <laughs> he was telling me that he kept giving me advice about the script, saying that the script is too slow, there's not enough action, this kid should kill his girlfriend, and <laughs> she should have a gun in her purse, etc. 
And my script had much more action at that time than it eventually did because whatever he would tell me to do, I would do the opposite. And so I kept taking the things out that he liked somehow. <laughs> and I'd, at, at the time, I don't really know why I was doing that. Now I realize why, because I didn't want him to think that I was just, you know, just a puppet and would do whatever he said. So by the end, when I gave, I kept bringing him back the script with more of the action taken out, <laughs> and I would watch his reaction, which was usually, you know, he was dumbfounded. And then he would say, well, I don't, you know, it's getting further in the other direction. And finally, when I gave him the completed script, he, he said um, that he was very proud that I didn't take his advice and that I followed <laughs> my own in style. So. But I really wasn't conscious of why I was doing that at the time. Um, one thing that's interesting in this is it's sort of like uh, it's kind of like a hallmark of your style that we'll be seeing in some of the other clips, is that this is mainly a very long take, this sequence. Uh, there are two cutaways, I guess, to Chris Parker, but otherwise it's, uh, it's just kind of giving the camera, giving the screen to an actor and sort of letting them go. Was this something that you arrived at through a conscious decision of wanting to do that? Did economics play any role in it? Or? Certainly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I didn't. I only did one take. I remember the long joke. I didn't even have a second take to yeah. to select from. But primarily, that style came from just purely from economics. And I made this film too, partly inspired by a film by Amos Poe um, called *The Foreigner*, that he shot for like five thousand dollars or something in seventy-seven, seventy-eight, which was a kind of punk spirited film. And, uh, you know, he and his friend, Eric Mitchell, who became my friends, were saying, come on, Jim, you could make a film too, you know? So I, I was inspired by them, and they, they used that same kind of, basically similar style because of financial reasons. But one thing I wanted to say, the, uh, it shot in the, this scene's shot in the lobby of the St. Mark's Cinema that doesn't exist anymore, where at the time I was in, uh, working as an usher it was like a two-dollar theater or something, and they, I was the, the new usher, so they used to make me do things like, you know, Jim, get your flashlight, go down there and tell those Hells Angels there's no reefer smoking in the theater. <laughs> Stuff like Actually, that. Actually, I didn't recognize it was St. Mark's, but that seems very appropriate, because that was a kind of uh, auteurist theater in a way. They, I remember seeing things like Howard Hawks' Red Line 7000 there, and uh, I'm... It's one thing that's curious, though, is that the soundtrack, if I'm not mistaken, that one hears with during this scene is not Savage Innocence. No, it's a it sounds like it's a, a double a bill. Sergio Leone. Yeah. <laughs> is it a Sergio Leone? Yeah, but it was a double bill, and you oh. couldn't see the other poster. <laughs> yeah, it's it's from the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, well, what? Um, tell me what sort of like what happened when this uh, film, op uh, let's say, was finished. What what? Uh, did you find a way to show it, or did it take a while? Or Well, I first gave it to uh, NYU, uh, was having a film festival of its films by its students. And not only did they reject the film and send it back to me, but they sent a really nasty letter saying, you know, basically, what is this shit, you know? So then I, I was lost. I, I was playing in a, a rock band at the time, and I thought, okay, well, I made a film. I'm not going to make any more because no one's going to let me, but at least I made one film. And then um, this guy, Mark Weiss, uh, in New York, had he somehow saw the film and said that he would like to select the film for a film festival in, in Germany, in Mannheim. And I didn't even know any film festivals existed except for I'd heard of the Cannes Film Festival. And uh, so I said, wow, great. And they. The film was shown in Mannheim, and not only that, he said, well, you know, they'll, they'll fly you there and you can go to the festival. And I, I was amazed by that. I, I had no idea that, you know, I could get a free trip to Germany out of this film. So I went there, and the film was won a prize there that was about $2,000, and I had no money. I was behind on my rent, and I had these kind of mafia landlords and stuff. And so I came back not only with the, the $2,000, but then uh, WDR bought the film for German TV, which paid back the cost of the film. And the film was then 
asked uh, to be in the Berlin Festival and, and then the Rotterdam Festival, so then it sort of started for me. Yeah, I remember there was, in fact, as I recall, uh, after your first film, an issue of, I think, the German film magazine Film Critic that was devoted yes. to you, or yeah, devoted to the was. film. Yeah, yeah which, all of which was a huge shock to me. And at this point, had it, it hadn't shown in the United States, apart from at NYU. To this point, I yeah. don't think it's shown in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Except for this clip. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, all right, that's that's interesting in itself, so in the sense that um, that you, in a sense, had your, uh, let's say, were discovered in Europe. Uh, long before, well, let's see, well, certainly well before uh, Fenton and Paradise. Now, there's obviously, in terms of uh, financing Strange in Paradise, I know that started out as a short, I mean, with the intention of making it a feature, yes. is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I know that there were ways in which you were helped at different times by um, things like getting footage and so on, or maybe raw stock by, I think, both Ben Benders and Jean-Marie Straub and Daniel Huyet at different stages helped. Yes. But um, how, what point did that happen? In other words, how did, how did you initially get it set up? Um, initially, Vim Benders and uh, I had worked, because I was working with Nick, Nick Ray had asked me to be his kind of gopher during the making of the film Lightning Over Water. And at that time, I didn't really, I of course met Vim Benders, but I was the only person on the crew that was asked by Vim. So I was pretty much treated, I mean, asked by Nick to be part of the, the production. So I was kind of treated as an outsider. But uh, then Vim saw this film. After, I started shooting this film the day after Nick died, actually. And it was shot in 10 days. Um, and Vim saw the film after it was done. And then um, two years later, or, or a year and a half later, Vim and his partner at that time, Chris Sievernick, said that they had some film, unexposed film material left over from the film, um, The State of Things, and said, look, you can have it, you know, and you can, you can make a, that's a lot, a lot of the cost right there. You, you might want to make a, there's enough to make a 30, 40 minute film. So then I, I wrote, the first part of Stranger Than Paradise because I had that film material available to me. And then uh, Jean-Marie and Danielle gave me other film material to be uh, exposed for the black sections as, as leader. Um, so they, they both helped me. And then I was further helped when making it in. While I was editing the first half hour version, I wrote a script for the longer version. And when the short version was done, I also had a script to try to continue it. And I was helped by Paul Bartel, who uh, loaned me some money to actually to buy the rights of the first part back from Chris Sievernick, who did some kind of fishy things legally to me and had the negative under his name in a lab and things like that. So he kind of held it up for ransom, and Paul Bartel loaned me the money, who I met just by chance, also I think at a film festival. And uh, he had just had some success with this film, Eating Raoul, I think, at that time. And he, and he said, well, what's the problem, you know? And I explained to him, and he said, oh, well, you know, I'd like to help somebody starting out because I'm in the position to, I have a little money, and you can pay me back in a year. And he, he was really a, kind of an angel in that way to help the film. That allowed me then to get you know, the money from German TV. Or, uh, before that, I couldn't get financing because I didn't own the film. So he helped me, and then uh, I got German TV money and a German producer named Otto Grokenberger to help uh, finance the, the remaining part of the film. So I had really amazing people helping me out. I, I don't know why, but they did. One thing I've always been curious about is, uh, well, the Hungarian aspect of the film, does that relate to anything in, um, like in your family background or as in terms of people you knew? Or Well, it's two things. My family on my father's side was Czech and my grandmother, who was a lot like the Aunt Lottie character, um, was Czech. And 
Esther Ballant uh, was a member of the Squat Theater Group in New York, a theater company that was a kind of uh, experimental theater company from Budapest that were friends of mine and a lot of our friends used to hang out because they lived communally on 23rd Street in one big building which was also their theater. So it was a combination of those things, I guess. Well, I think um, it sounds like we're probably uh, at a good point where we could look at a clip. I think uh, the clip we're going to be looking at from Strangers in Paradise is fairly early in the, it's in the first section of the film and it's shortly after Esther Valente turns up in New York and arrives at the apartment of her cousin, Willie, I guess. Uh, and her name is uh, Eva. And so this is, this is actually the first scene when she gets to meet uh, Willie's friend Eddie, played by Richard Edson. So, um, I noticed in this scene there's another sort of little film reference uh, when uh, he's reading from the, Eddie's reading from the paper, <coughs> the one, I think, title of a film which is real, I think, is Tokyo Story. Well, there are horses, the names of race horses. Yeah. But there's a few Ozu in there. Uh, Ozu oh. films. Uh, oh, Passing Fancy. Spring, Passing Fancy. Oh, yeah. Um, I've stuck a few in there. Yeah. That's right. And it's worth putting out that in this, uh, the series here, there's going to be the flavor of green tea over rice. Um, not a good name for a racehorse. No. <laughs> but uh, would you say there, there was, do you feel an affinity with the, uh, with the, let's say, simplicity of Ozu's style, the idea of just sort of putting the camera in front of characters and... Um, oh yeah, very much. I mean, I have, I'm kind of contradictory in my own tastes. Um, I, I like very much things that are very pure in a way. Um, Ozu's films, or the films of Carl Dreyer, or um, you know things by Joseph Cornell, or um, Cy Twombly, or uh, music by Anton Webern, or the Ramones, for that matter. The things that are very pure really appeal to me strongly. I also like very messy things too, though. Like uh, you know, I like um, Blue Cheer, or you know, paintings by the you know, by Jackson Pollock or de Kooning, or I like, uh, you know, King of New York, films like that, Detour, by, you know, things that are also messy appeal to me as well, but my own aesthetic seems, tends to go toward a more kind of pure form of things. Well, one thing I've always liked about the, the stretches of Black Leader in Stranger Than Paradise is that they make me think of uh, the shots as being almost a little bit like blues choruses. That it's sort of like um, it's a way of uh, bracketing scenes in a way. You think of them as units much more. Just like uh, reminds me of in the earlier clip when he tells the joke. He says, "This is the joke that has this, you know, this title." Um, how did you hit on the idea of those? those uh, and did you spend a lot of time editing them? I mean, in terms of timing and so on. Uh, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how long they should be, and they do vary somewhat. But uh, they were originally in my script because I wanted a way of, I didn't want a hard cut from one place to another. I, I like that, you know, like a blues chorus or almost like a respiration, you know, a way of like letting the image sink in before another one hits you. So they, they were intended from the start, but I, we did play around with uh, exactly how long they should be, I remember. Did it make um, the shooting of this film, the, the fact of having those kind of long takes, would you say it made it harder to do or easier? Well, it works both ways. I think it's better for the actors because it's more like theater where they, they maintain their character longer rather than having to be and working with actors not real experienced with film acting and myself not experienced at this, uh, as a director, um, that was helpful. Uh, it also makes it more difficult because we had, had very little film material and if any one of us makes a mistake, then the take is ruined, you know, so you have to go back and start the whole thing again. So it kind of worked both ways. So. Um, I'm also curious that we both before and after you made this film, how easy or difficult was it uh, 
that the fact was that the film was in black and white. In other words, uh, did you did, uh, did you did you encounter any resistance from um, I don't know distributors or people putting money into it or? Yeah, definitely because they would always say, "Well, you can't, you can't, we can't sell it. To, we can't get a good price for video, or we can't sell it to television. So we we can't pay you much for it." Um, before making the film was not a problem because the film material offered to me was black and white and when I wrote the, the story I knew that it would be black and white but after the fact it was kind of problematic and at that point in 1982 and 1984 um, even then uh, black and white was not like fashionable on MTV or whatever it was still kind of you know, they, they really kind of balked at, at it as far as distribution and sales to TV and video. So it was kind of prob problematic selling the film, although more so in the States than in Europe for some reason. Well, I guess black, black and white hung on much longer, and it's, uh, it seems like that, that even now it's still easier to make uh, probably black and white. Maybe, maybe not now, but at least up to a few years ago. In least. Europe? Yeah. Probably still now, I would think. Um, it seems like that there are even still labs where it's possible to do it in Europe, which, which yeah. becomes harder. Well, it's getting things. difficult everywhere because the really great black and white technicians are old guys that have retired or, you know, they haven't passed that expertise along, really. So, And it's a very different thing to light black and white also than, than color, although, you know, directors of photography are, are aware of that, you know, younger ones, because they can shoot... But now black and white's more expensive than, to shoot than color. The processing is more expensive. So, so it's becoming now. It's, now it's now it's the luxury in a sense. Yeah, and it's still there's still a lot of resistance to it. You know, I know that uh, Tim Burton had a lot of trouble. Uh, he had to leave one studio to make his film about. Uh, um, What's the film he just completed? We were talking about. Oh, the uh, film, the biopic about Ed Wood, Ed, Ed, Ed Wood Jr. Ed Wood Jr. Yeah, he he had a lot of trouble making that in black and white. I mean, Tim Burton. Well, maybe Schindler's List will help him along. Now, um, have you had some of the same problem? I mean, it come, this comes up in the later films, actually. But when uh, you use subtitles, or is that is that been? In other words, has there been a comparable resistance from, any, from anyone about? Yeah, I've had trouble in Europe because I have refused, with, a ver with few exceptions, to allow my films to be subtitled. And it was, in Italy, it was very unusual to release down by law uh, with subtitles because the Italians dub their own films, even the ones in Italian. So. Um, <laughs> And uh, that, that, that's, been, that's been a problem. I have uh, not been able to make TV sales um, to larger TV stations for prime, for prime time viewing in Europe or whatever um, with subtitles. It's always seemed to me that there's a, something contradictory about it because, I mean, although it's considered box office poison in the United States, a film with subtitles, people tend to forget that Dances with Wolves has lots of subtitles. Um, more recently, Schindler's List, that there seem to be lots of films that have subtitles that don't bother people. Well, also, so. if you have a, an interesting actor, you know, I mean, their voice is 50% of their performance. Yeah. So you're taking that away as well. It's kind of like being ripped off, I think, when you dub an interesting actor. It's, you know, I mean, I, I sometimes dubbing is funny. I, I like the, you know, the kung fu style dubbing. And now I will take you to my father. You know, yes. <laughs> well, I've heard in Italy one reason why it's so important to dub so much there is because accents are very important. That if you that for different parts of Italy, there have to be different kinds of regional accents, and if they and if they do it if they do it wrong, people laugh in the wrong places and so on. But Fellini, I met Fellini the first time I met him was when Down by Law was being released in Italy, and he said to me. But Jim, why you don't dub the film? <laughs> because Fellini will shoot a scene and have the actors just say numbers, just count, and he'll write the dialogue later and put it in. So <laughs> he, he, I, I like the face, but not the voice. So I choose one for the voice, one for face. I, 
So he was sense, very confused by uh, why I was adamant about it. <laughs> well, in a, in a way, I think what, what it means in effect is that most Italian filmmakers like Fellini are really silent directors. In a Fellini sense, maybe, particularly yeah. in a way. Marcello. I awoke from a strange and disturbing dream. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I like the, some of those Italian movies, they have the same guys, you know, dubbing each film. You start to recognize the, the voices. <laughs> well, speaking of Italians, how did you meet Roberto Benigni? Like, or how did you encounter him, let's say? Uh, let's just, I met him in um, Salsa Maggiore in Italy in a small film festival where I was the one and only, first and last time that I was a member of the jury, and he was also. And uh, I met him, he was on the jury, and also a mutual friend, we had a mutual friend. And from the moment I met him, I just fell in love with the guy. And we did, he spoke no English, and I spoke no Italian, and we spoke for hours in gestures and bad French. <laughs> and if French people would have heard us, they would have, you know, been... Was uh, not enough room to swing a cat something that Roberto had come out with at one point? Or? Well, we collected so many things. I don't remember where, what came from where anymore, but uh, possibly. I know that when I first met Roberto, he had su subscribed to a, a magazine in Italy that was to teach you English and had a lot of ridiculous expressions. So a lot of those we pulled together from there and they ended up in the film. Uh, how did you hit on the idea of doing this in um, Louisiana? Um, mostly through music from New Orleans. I'm a big fan, blues and R&B fan, so I had never been to New Orleans when I wrote the script, but I had a lot of images in my head, mostly just from, from the music of New Orleans. So it kind of, that, that just kind of drew me there. And were you thinking of uh, prison films much that you'd seen? or? No, actually I wasn't really. I was trying to figure out how to get characters that don't like each other stuck together and, you know, prison. Yeah. One, one quick way of doing that. Yeah, there's, one, there's an interesting way for me which one of the themes of Stranger in Paradise is how the character is saying that you keep, you know, no matter how much you keep moving around, things stay the same. And there's a way in this film that uh, certain things repeat themselves. Like after they break out of prison, they find themselves in a shack where they, even the bunks where they're staying at are sort of like in the same kind of, it's yes. like a, a duplication of where they were before. Yeah. Um, was this a much harder film to shoot, would you say, than uh, Stranger, or was it easier? Um, this film was a lot more fun to make. I, I, Stranger was harder. Uh, we had less time, less money. In Stranger Than Paradise, we shot, if you'd see the whole film, there's a sequence where they're in a hotel in Florida, a motel, and that motel had three rooms in it. And we all, the whole, the crew and cast stayed in those rooms, taking turns who would sleep on the floor, you know. So it was not that much fun uh, making Stranger Than Paradise. This was more fun. We had a real, a real motel. Just, we each had our own <laughs> room, even, you know. And did you run have a down motel, but it was it was fun there. Did you have lots of time to scout locations and so on? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did for Stranger too, though. Yeah. But uh, I, I love I love New Orleans. I still love it. I just went back there a few months ago, and uh, I just really love that that town. And were the locations that you used? Did you do much to change them? I mean, to redress them, or were they pretty much as you, as you found them? Uh, in this film, yeah, uh, almost always the way we found them. We only changed them by the way we lit them or moved some furniture around. Or uh, There's a scene uh, where uh, early in the film, Tom Waits, his character, and his girlfriend, Ellen Barkin, um, stay in a house, live in a house that was, has graffiti and things on the walls. That was exactly the way we found, you know, it was someone that we met there, a girl lived there, and her former boyfriend had been a disc jockey or something. There were records everywhere, and and we just used her house exactly as it was. Um, and this was a, and this was an actual prison that you. Yes, yeah. the uh, central lockup or the Orleans Parish Prison in in uh, New Orleans proper. So there were real prisoners there at the time that you were yes, shooting. Yes, there were. Um, in fact, 
I, I don't know what that was in my head, but I decided it would be a, a brilliant idea for Tom Waits and John Lurie and Roberto and myself, since I was making them do it, to be locked up in the prison for a day without the guards on that cell, in that cell block or the prisoners not knowing that we weren't real new prisoners. So uh, I was put in a cell with Roberto and Tom and John were put in a cell and it was pretty scary. We had to do everything you do, keep your hands in your pockets when you're out of the cell and, and we were treated pretty roughly by the guards and the other inmates but Tom and it was good for Tom and John they were, well, not that Tom doesn't have experience in jail cells. <laughs> but they were actually kind of frightened by the experience. I, on the other hand, I was also, but I was in the cell with Roberto, who was, thought the whole idea was useless and was only talking to me about, yes, Jim, this is interesting, but tonight, wh which restaurant should we go? <laughs> <laughs> I would like a linguine al dente, very, you know, so. <laughs> it had no effect on Roberto at all. <laughs> so, I guess it must have been a relief when the, did the, did the other prisoners feel, um, angry when they found out that you were... Well, we were gone by the time they I found see. out. I see, yeah. <laughs> Carefully orchestrated exit. So. Um, and I gather he must, through the experience of making this film, he must have learned English a lot, a lot better. Quite a bit, yes. And he's very quick, obviously. Very intelligent man. He learned really fast. But we played a lot of games on him, tricks on him, teaching him the wrong things. <laughs> and to this day still, although he now knows it's not, it's not correct, but he didn't for years, we taught him that to piss or to pee was to flame, we told him. <laughs> and for years after, he was, excuse me, I go now to flame. <laughs> I will come back after I flame. <laughs> How did he find out he was wrong, I wonder? Well, he finally <laughs> found out, and he played a trick back on John Lurie uh, in Cannes at the film festival where an Italian TV crew was interviewing John, but they did not speak English. So Roberto, no problem, I translate for you. <laughs> so they would, ask, they would ask things like, um, what, uh, how do you come upon your craft as an actor of Stanislavski or method acting, or, or is it intuitive or what? in Italian, and Roberto would say to John, I don't know why, but they want to know what did you have for breakfast? <laughs> and so John, John's response would be bacon, eggs. <laughs> so he looked, he looked like a real idiot. And <laughs> he did get, get back at us. Um. Well, it seems, it's interesting that there's a way in which from, actually, it seems like a, a gradual, a, a steady, oh, I don't know, almost a curve, that from Stranger in Paradise to Down by Law to Mystery Train, they be, your films become, let's say, more and more bilingual in some way, or, or even trilingual, in the sense that, they, that more and more of a foreign language is sort of like used and becomes more let's say, central to what's going on in some ways. Now, it, do, do you think this is partly a, a consequence of the amount of traveling around you did with your own films and being in like other countries and, yeah. and so on? Yeah, it comes from two things, I think. From the fact that I traveled and met a lot of people that don't speak, that English is not their first language. And also because I've lived in New York for so long and I live on the Bowery downtown and in my neighborhood there are people speaking there are Dominicans and Puerto Ricans whose accents are slightly different. There are like um, Hasidic Jews and Sicilians, and uh, you know there's a, a lot a lot of people mixed in there. A lot of Chinese, and so that it's that too somehow. I hear different languages swirling around me every day when I you know when I leave my house too, and the fact that America is you know that's what America is is a lot of um, immigrants who committed genocide on the indigenous people here so they could take it over, you know. Well, it's interesting. It seems like it's happening, I mean, in a way, all over the world, more and more, that people are making films, sometimes in languages they don't know. For example, I mean, I just discovered recently that 
Kislowski's Blue, is in, you know, which is in French, Kislowski hardly knows French at all. Uh, that he had to, for example, speak to Juliette Binoche, the lead actress, in English mm-hmm. when he was making that. Um, well, the independent Max, filmmaker oh, John Jost just made a film in Italy in Italian, and he knows very little Italian. Yeah. Well, I think Max O'Fool's always impressed me by making films in English, French, Italian. He made that one Italian film, and in, in German. Uh, he probably spoke all those languages. Though. Yes, and I think Dreyer did also. when he, when he But you know what? Yeah. There's something interesting. I love to watch. I really got into, since I've been to Japan a number of times, I bought a lot of videotapes there that were not subtitled, uh, films by Ozu and Mitsuguchi and Suzuki and a lot of other people. And I like to watch them without knowing what they're saying. I've sort of got into that because language is a very... Language is a code that we communicate through, but even within that code, you can tell through someone's inflection what their emotional state is. And so acting is... The language of acting is not primarily a, la- a spoken language and you can read how people feel or what they're, where they're at emotionally without knowing what language they speak. So my first experience really was directing, Mystery Train was directing the Japanese actors in Japanese. French I understand, in Night on Earth French I understand, Italian I understand a little. Um, I'm learning more and more. Finnish I don't understand but their Finnish people's emotions are very, they're very open you can always read their emotions. So I, I think language is a <laughs> secondary. Well, one thing that also occurs language. to me that might have been p- part of your background that might have led to this, at least a, actually a background that we share, is that year, uh, that, year that you spent in Paris going to films at the Cinémathèque. Because when I used to go to the Cinémathèque, Langlois used to, Henri Langlois used to have this philosophy that uh, he would just as soon, in fact, they even prefer to show you a film without subtitles. Or if they did have subtitles, they wouldn't be ones that would help you. I mean, I once saw a Boonwell Mexican film that was dubbed into German and subtitled in Portuguese, for example. <laughs> and he liked to do things like that. And with the idea that, that it wasn't... So I saw more movies than not. I mean, most of the movies I used to see at the Cinematheque were ones that I, in languages that I couldn't follow and, and know. Yeah, I saw Central European films at the Cinematheque and other films I had no, no clue what they were saying. But the heart of the film, the heart of the story is still there, though. I mean, unless it's a totally dialogue-oriented film in there. But, you know, it's, you, you can read that. Yeah, although it's a pity that it's, there's so much of, the fi- of films in the world that are automatically considered non-commercial just because it's assumed that you know, people won't be able to see something if it's in a language they don't understand. In a way, it's, um, it seems like an awful lot of commercial decisions get made on that basis. Um, in the case, though, of, for example, of working out the dialogue for Mystery Train, did you, in order to, like, for example, get the right kind of Japanese idioms, did you basically work with translators suggesting sort of like, uh, in other words, was it always a question of trying to translate English ideas into Japanese or learning certain phrases and then trying to work with those? No, I, what I would do is I would write little, uh, I do a lot of rehearsing and, and improvs where the characters, the actors are in character, but the scene we're doing, I write on the spot and it is not in the film but it's maybe before the film begin, the story begins. And with the Japanese kids, I would stick in, like, okay, they're going to go to the movies, and he wants to see a movie with Steve McQueen, but she wants to see a movie with uh, Elizabeth Taylor. Well, I have those two words I know. You yes. know I know Steve, when he says Steve McQueen, and so I have some little guide in there. And then I can, and I give them the dialogue, and a translator tells them the idea of the scene, and then I watch their interactions with each other. Then once my script was written, um, you know, we rehearsed it also, and with the translator, discussed a lot of nuances of how to express things with the actors, and we made joint decisions and eliminated phrases or replaced them, even though I didn't know myself. It was explained to me the difference of the nuance, and then we would discuss which one was appropriate. So it was not really a problem. It's interesting. I have kind of like before and after questions about this. First, did you ever get to see Mystery Train with a Japanese audience? Uh, I don't think so. No. Yeah. I introduced it, but didn't stay for the film. Yeah. 
And I'm just wondering if you found out that there were in any way uh, different responses to it, and to the Japanese segment in Japan, or... I don't know. I, my films are very, they, very, they're very popular in Japan. I, I don't know why, but, uh, and that one particularly, although all, Night on Earth did even better, and, and Down by Law was, a, all, all my films have been very successful in Japan, probably due to the distributors that I have, which are really excellent. But, uh, how did how did you uh, or where did you find the two Japanese actors? Well, uh, Yuki Kudo, I had the girl I had seen. In, in fact, the first time I ever saw her was in a film in uh, the film festival in Italy, where I was on the jury with Roberto. A film called Crazy Family. She was 12 years old at the time that she acted in that, and she was hilarious. And I was really, I was really drawn to her face and her kind of expressiveness and wackiness, you know? And then I wrote the, the part for her, and uh, I, I had since then, uh, Bernardo Bertolucci told me to see a film called The Typhoon Club that was not released outside, not here anyway. I saw it in Japan, and she was also in that. So I, I then wrote it for her, and then um, cast for the, the other, for the, the guy, which I was lucky to find, uh, Masatoshi Nagase in Tokyo. But I saw about 50 young actors before I, I found him. Did they speak English very much? Uh, Yuki spoke a little, uh, Masatoshi, none, really, except rock and roll, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you were having to direct through interpreters to, certain, to some extent? Yes, yeah, yeah completely. I mean, I had a, an interpreter, but uh, it's funny because even my language to them as a director was not somehow hampered by, by, by my lack of understanding the, the you know, language words, but we were still able to communicate somehow. Well, that's interesting, I, like, as the experience you had with, with Benini. Yeah. Yes, and I taught them to speak, to speak, say some really foul things in English, which they were very proud of. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we we're ready to, to look at a uh, little bit of... Uh, actually happens right near the beginning of Mystery Train. Tell me, the uh, spiel that uh, they get about Sun, Sun Records, is that a real spiel or is that a real uh, tourist guide? Yeah, we, we got the text from Sun Studio of the, the tour guide text and just had her deliver it in rapid fire. <laughs> so it was a real te text. And was this, a, I guess this was a was it similar to Down by Law in, the, in terms of uh, getting to know Memphis and so on that you had, in other words, and it, it's again a case of, I guess, of being interested in the place because of the music, but, uh, but did you uh, spend much time there before? Well, I, I ha again, I hadn't been to Memphis when I wrote the script. But as soon as I was done, I went to Memphis to, to look for locations. And so it was, again, music that kind of drew me to write something so that I could, I could go there. And was, uh, is Chaucer Street something you actually found there? No. Uh, we had that sign made. I see. <laughs> Which is, uh, yeah, I see it as a remnant, uh, probably maybe a remnant of your uh, English major background. Well, there are... Because I know you had the idea of it being like Canterbury Tales in some ways. Yes, the form of the film is a little bit from Canterbury Tales in a way. But uh, there are a lot of streets in Memphis named after poets. Quite a few. Uh, Ch Chaucer wasn't one of them, though. Um, did you find, because you use a very small part of Memphis in, in this, did you find that it was, um, did Memphis wind up be surprising you or being very different from what you imagined? Or Yeah, it did because the main center of Memphis around Beale Street was completely torn down in 1968-69 after King was assassinated to prevent, you know, uh, disturbances. So they just kind of raised the whole center of Memphis, which had been the largest, like, black neighbor, inner city black neighborhood um, for years in, in the South, anyway. So it was a really vibrant, amazing place prior to that, and they just kind of tore it down. So the kind of empty lots and holes in, in places in the center of the city was very odd and kind of haunting and sad. But Memphis, anyway consists of a lot of like closed down gas stations and empty parking lots and 
and it still has a lot of ghosts around there. You know, you feel a lot of weird stuff in Memphis. Um, and and what's also yeah. one thing that where oh, we shot later in a in a a lot of this film takes place in a hotel, and the building that we shot the interiors in was connected to the building from uh, which is on the back of it is right across from the Lorraine Hotel where Martin Luther King was assassinated and uh -huh. they said that uh, supposedly, you know, James Earl Ray supposedly assassinated King from that building, which was weird. We weren't aware of that when we selected it as a location. Did you find it was uh, harder to shoot in a city than, uh, like, I don't know, uh, sort of out in the, out in the country, like, uh, was it, does, it, does it make much difference? Uh, I don't know. I don't think it, you know, you, you run into different problems depending on where you are. I, it's just different. I don't think you could say one is easier than the other. There's a, there's an idea sort of in the, that you hit on in, in Mystery Trains. It sort of carries over to your next film, Night on Earth, which is the idea of all the different parts happening at the same time. Um, just wondering if there was anything in particular that inspired you to sort of start exploring that idea. Well, there was one thing that I can recall, which was uh, a book by William Faulkner called The Wild Palms, which is a book of two separate novellas that he wrote that the publishers at the time said, yeah, but, you know, Bill, uh, we, we need a novel here. Um, this is, you know, two short novels, and uh, that doesn't sell. So he, he, whether, I don't know whether they suggested it or whether he thought of it, but he alternated chapters of two different stories that he wrote separately. And the kind of nuances and repercussions of doing that, the, the certain themes that exist in both stories and the way they work on each other is really, really beautiful and strong. I and agree, although I think I always heard it a little different the way he wrote it, that he, he started writing one of the stories. I think it was the love story. And then he found that, that at a certain point, he felt it was missing something. So as a kind of counterpoint, he started the other story and he actually wrote them in the alternating, you know, in terms of alternating between one chapter and another. Oh. And the way it was published. What happened, there was a problem, I don't know if originally, but at some point, they got printed separately. But I find that what's interesting is when you read them separately as individual stories, they don't have anything like the impact of what they do when they're... Yeah, I can't imagine reading them separately, really. But. It's, uh, it's interesting, though, that in that case, they're... There's a simultaneity actually in the prose, but they're not necessarily taking place at the same time. Oh yeah, I didn't. It wasn't yeah. the structure that that I tried to imitate, but it, it was just the that structure. Um, I found really inspiring, so I, I started a structure not not the same, but somehow it, inspiration came from that. Um, certainly, the Canterbury Tales as well, because it's a beautiful structure of people traveling and telling stories as they travel. Right, there's even a, a, a parallel with the religious idea because it's a kind of a religious pilgrimage that's being made at least by the Japanese couple or you could say it's like a, you know, it's going to shrines actually. Yes. And there's also uh, Boccaccio's Decameron where they're sitting, waiting out the plague, sitting around telling stories which contains some of the same stories as the Canterbury Tales. Um, so when you were actually wor writing uh, Mystery Train, were you working on the three stories at once or at all, or were you or, or just writing them quite separately? Or you um, were thinking you were thinking of them all together, though, obviously, because they, there's well, a way in which, with the third at least, the our memory of the first two become very important. Yeah, I, I think I had, I, as I always write, I make a whole lot of notes and collect them, and then sit down and, and write them into the script. So. That simultaneity was, you know, was in my head before I started writing. That that structure. It's interesting that what, in a sense, what you've done, um, actually in a quite different way, I think, from other filmmakers, is return to the possibility of making shorts, even though they're interconnected shorts. Um, which, I mean, of course, there was New York Stories a few years ago, but that was by three different directors. And in most cases, there are very few cases where you have one filmmaker actually making uh, 
short stories, to, you know, that are sort of like put together. Uh, well, there's a tradition of Japanese, like ghost stories, like Kobayashi and, and some other, a few other directors, I think, that have made episodic films like that. Yeah, I um, guess actually, come, come to think of it, uh, Kurosawa's Dreams is, Akira Kurosawa's Dreams yeah, is but one. That's one. After, but yeah. yeah. Um, and it's a kind of Italian light comedy tradition, but like you said, it's usually different directors doing each section. Right, I remember there was a Seven Deadly Sins, the, an Italian one. In fact, there was a, both a French and Italian version of the Seven Deadly Sins. Um, but I, after making Mystery Train, I never intended to do that again, to make an episodic film like that, with the exception of this thing I'm working on over a period of time, a collection of short films called Coffee and Cigarettes. But uh, those I write as I go along. You know, it's not something, a project that I just do that and then it's done as a film. I'm sort of collecting them here and there. But I never intended to make another film like that. Um, Night on Earth was just kind of an accident because an, another script I had written for reasons I won't go into, I was not able to make and was frustrated and I wrote Night on Earth extremely fast in about eight days, mostly initially just to, to shoot outside of America and work with some friends of mine in Europe and stuff. So, Was, was it hard to set up? In uh, terms of, uh, it was complicated. I yeah. bet. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, why don't we look a little bit now. I think what, what I've selected for a clip in this case is from the New York episode, which is the second episode in the film. And it's, uh, it, this occurs sort of like about halfway through that episode. Um, but it lets you see at least three so, of the is actors. Is everyone still awake yet? So <laughs> some people are awake. I have to apologize. I should have explained, maybe, if, for those of you who haven't seen the film, that uh, Helmut Grokenberger, who incidentally is, I guess, an, whose last name is an homage to the produ your producer, yes. um, is in fact the one who's the cab driver. But because he can't drive, it's Giancarlo Esposito who takes over the driving, which is why he's at the wheel. Um, one thing I really like about this sequence is, in, in this case, about how the sort of um, foreigner and outsider really, uh, which hap it's what happens to a certain extent, I think, in Down by Law too, but not in what we see here, really sort of humanizes the other two, or at least uh, makes a real change in the emotional temperature, sort of, of what's going on. Well, I've been monopolizing um, Jim up to now. I think maybe uh, some of you would like to uh, have some questions of your own. Um, I can see you a little bit. Yes. Your comments on your acting for Oscar Specky and not Fletcher at Cowboys of America. Do you enjoy doing that? Very bad acting. Well, I don't know. It was just a little cameo in his film. He's uh, one of my favorite directors, it's Aki Karasmaki, the Finnish director. And I, I like his films really a lot, so I was happy to do a little cameo in it. And then I just acted in a film, uh, also a kind of cameo, this past summer, shot in Finland, uh, a biker movie called um, Iron Horseman, which Aki produced in a young French Swiss director named Gilles Charmant directed. Uh, uh, yes. You and so many other great artists thought of Akron. What is it about Akron? Well, I think the key is the come out of Akron. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. Akron is a pretty dismal place. Uh, it's very, you know, when I grew up there, everyone's father worked for the rubber companies, including my own and my uncle, and it was just a place we, you know, my friends and I want, knew we wanted to get out of, so. What? Um, well, there was nothing to do there, so. Yes? Um, a lot of the settings that you choose are those kinds of settings where there's nothing to do. They remind me of when I used to go to bowling tournaments with my dad in Alpha, Nevada. So how careful, uh, you know, setting in yourself to be part of as much of a character as the actors. How carefully do you choose those settings? Well, I, you said it better than I could. I think the locations are as important or almost as characters in the film. 
So yeah, I choose them very carefully. And you're right, I do, and I, I do, I guess because I'm from Akron, have a kind of weird or perverse nostalgia for like kind of post-industrial places, you know, I, I, I find them beautiful somehow. Uh, one thing I just want to inject, it's a pity, but the one thing we have, we, you know, we have time to look at, although they'll be in, shown in this series, are, are some of the coffee and cigarettes. Oh, we're not going to look at the last one? Or uh, I don't now. think we'll have time, but they'll probably have time. But I think, uh, I'm curious, that in that case, though, did you, you've used set, uh, set, and I'm wondering um, that, why that you uh, decided to shoot those. I know that there's a kind of a use of a overhead angle that you use, it's, that is at least in a couple of them. That's well, it's not a sound stage, it's just it's, a place. I see. It was actually, it was a set built in a recording studio because the day before we had shot this, did they see the video clip? You saw the Tom Waits yes. thing. And then we used that same set the next day to shoot this short film, which was black and white, unlike the the, the video. We changed it a little bit, but it was only a matter of con convenience, really, you know. And is it true that you're hoping, I mean, I've heard that you're going to be, w wait till you've got enough of them, sort of like, uh, that you made enough of those in that series and possibly, possibly release them all as a feature? Yeah, I think I will. I, my intention is for them to work on their own, but at the same time, I've uh, written dialogue that can't, little things repeat in each one. It reappears, so I have shot five of them now, um, and eventually, when I have about twelve or however many makes up, you know, eighty minutes or something, I'll at least release them on video together. I don't know if anyone would release them theatrically. It's it's also interesting to me the way that they you know repeat certain camera angles too. That they're that they're in. I've only seen a couple. I um, gather this was a series that actually started with Saturday Night Live. Is that right? Uh, yeah, they gave me the. They asked me to make a short film for them, and whenever the first one was '86, '87, and um, they gave me the money, so I, I made the first one. And then since then, have made. This is the third, and then I have two more that are not edited but are, are shot. So, are they all in different cities, or? Um, no, I shot three of them in New York, and one in Memphis, and one in California. But I have more written to or sketched, so I'm going to make some more now. Well, I believe this is the most recent of uh, Jim's works. Perhaps we've got time for just a couple more questions before we call it a night. Uh, yes? Um, you talked earlier about your other cinematographers. How did you, uh, how did you come about working with Frederick um, hmm. I had seen, well, I'd seen his work, um, the films he shot for David Lynch and particularly also a film called River's Edge that I really loved the photography, the way the photography fit the story. Uh, it didn't seem slapped on, it seemed to grow out of the, the nature of the film, the subject and the feeling of the film. So I was very impressed by his work and had, had met him briefly and also had read an interview with him that was very, very what he said was very strong. and. Um, it was a lot like what I felt about cinematography, the way that it should grow from the essence of the film and not be a, a signature put over the film. And so I, I called him up and talked with him and then went to L.A. to, to meet with him and he agreed to, to do the films, uh, Night on Earth. Yes? Well, we changed the dialogue a lot in rehearsals, like very much. I'm not interested in tying them to the script at all, except to the ideas of, of an exchange of dialogue, but not exactly how they phrase it. So I like to keep them in, you know, within the, the way the script works, how things go back and forth, but how they say things. Rarely am I adamant about. Sometimes I am if it's a very particular joke that I want them to retain. But uh, I, I like, I, I'm interested in them being the character and, and believable as the character. So we change things quite a lot. And a lot of the best things in my films have been things actors came up with during rehearsal periods in improvs that I then note down and put into the script. So really a lot of it comes from them. Well, 
I think we're out of time, but thank you very much, Jim, and thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thank you.